Now, how do we get to holiness? You see, it is fine to say that we get rid of all these sin habits, but the point is that they are extremely difficult to get rid of, and that is why they become sin habits. It is fine to say that we want to get rid of our sin addictions, but the very definition of the word addiction means that it is extremely difficult for us to get out of it. So how do we handle this? Well, there is a certain thing that we, uh, a certain image that we can use to help us understand better. I would like to use the image of a spiritual warfare, a spiritual battle. We need to understand how the devil is attacking us on the one hand. Okay. And then on the other hand, we need to have the strength to resist him. These two things are vital. To put it in another way, if a military or an army is strong, but it doesn't know where the enemy is hitting, uh, going to hit, then it becomes vulnerable because you cannot be strong at absolutely every point. So uh, if you think that the enemy is going to hit you from one angle and they do a feint and they hit you somewhere else instead, the, most, the greater likelihood is that you're going to suffer significant damage. So you need to know how the enemy is attacking you. That's one point. The other point is this, even if you know where the enemy is attacking and you have a very poorly trained military and you cannot defend yourself, knowing that the enemy is going to storm you doesn't help anyway because you're still going to cave in. So there are two parts to it, understanding what the, uh, the, the, the threat is and then our personal readiness for it. Now the tactics of the devil is this, he uses pain and suffering to cause us to lose our holiness or to keep us from holiness. First Peter is written in the context of suffering. And when I read First Peter the first time around, I found it very puzzling because here you have a context of people who are in pain and who are suffering. And what does Peter tell them? Be holy. I thought, huh? I mean, people are hurting and you tell them, be holy? I mean, like, do they need any more problems? Why, why do you tell, tell them, be holy when they are hurting? Well, first of all, let's look at the context. First Peter chapter 1, verse 6 says this, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. So you know they were suffering grief in all kinds of trials. They were suffering, they were hurting. Another passage, then there are many of these, but I'll just pick two. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. So the people, the audience of First Peter were people who were hurting. And there are many people around us who are hurting today, including Christians. And the pain that we experience are of different kinds. Some of us experience pain in terms of actual persecution, like our brother prayed just now for the people who are persecuted, right within our neighborhood, right within our uh, regional neighborhood. You know, that's one kind of pain. Then we suffer all kinds of other pains. <clears throat> you know, I thought that I was immune to chicken pox. Until one day I was in America, I was just on a trip, on a visit there in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and suddenly I broke out in chicken pox in a foreign country. You know, I was uh, staying at the seminary then. And I was really downright miserable. I was about 30 years old then, and they say that the older you are, when you get chicken pox, the worse it is. And mine was really bad. It was like from the top of my head all the way down to my feet, all right? And... Uh, <clears throat> And I was more or less by myself. We had an apartment. There were three other seminarians. I was uh, visit, visiting the seminary. I was not a, a seminarian myself. And they were helpful enough. But I was a real sight. I mean, first of all, I couldn't go out because I couldn't pass this chicken pox around. And next, when it scabbed over, you know, there were all these pieces of scab all over my face. And although I was no longer infectious, and in fact, on my homeward flight, when I was uh, flying back to Singapore, uh, I had all these scabs all over me. Okay, <laughs> So it was really awful, really awful. Um, so when I was sitting there feeling itchy and so miserable, I was telling myself, you know, probably there must be some meaning to this. <laughs> 
I hope there is. You know, I'm so uncomfortable. I'm in such misery. I, I hope there's some spiritual significance to all this. But maybe there isn't. Maybe it's just part of the vicissitudes of life. You know, whether you catch a cold or something like that, you don't ask, is there spiritual significance because I caught a cold? Okay, but uh, <clears throat> it's just that this is a little bit more severe. Uh, but there is still a significance, even if it is not directly related to a spiritual cause. For example, it is not because I stand up for my faith that I got chicken pox. If I stood up for my faith and got chicken pox, at least I can glory that I stood up for Christ and I got chicken pox. But no such luck, you know, uh, it was just chicken pox. Okay. But something happens to us when we are in pain doesn't matter what that pain is, whether it is a physical health issue, uh, 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 a sickness, uh, a crippling disease of some sort. Pain causes us to focus. Pain causes us to focus on the things that count. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> if you trip and twist your ankle and you fall down, what do you do? You focus on that ankle, correct? You do all you can to avoid weight on that ankle. Okay? And, and you do everything to avoid pain on that particular ankle. I remember once I twisted my ankle when I was running. I was telling myself that I don't have time to run longer distances. So today I'm going to run faster to make up for the lack of time. Uh, this was... Uh, back uh, in my home in the States, and I was on uh, Tyler State Park. And then while I was running, I was on this track. And um, this track has a lot of black walnuts. Those of you who don't know, the black walnut looks green, but the inside is black, and it's about yay big, all right? And there, there are lots of black walnuts strewn on the ground, um, and I was running without my glasses, and I stepped on one of them <clears throat> and slipped and twisted my ankle really badly. I thought I might have even broken it. So I was in severe, severe pain. Um, and um, Lily had finished her run and she was probably waiting for me and, and, and I knew I just couldn't run. I sat there for about five minutes and I tried to limp back. So it was really excruciating pain. And then uh, while I was trying to walk back, this uh, ranger came along on a horseback and uh, uh, a lady ranger and said, do you need a ride? <laughs> <laughs> I looked at her on the horse and I said, um, I think not. <laughs> uh, I don't know how to get onto that horse. But, uh, and I limped all the way back. But I, I could tell you that I was doing everything I could to avoid stepping on that foot. And yet I had to step on it in order to make the next excruciating uh, step to get back. <clears throat> pain focuses our attention like nothing else does. Okay. When we are in pain, we ask ourselves, how do we get out of this pain? And, and it focuses our attention also in a different way, in that we begin to see things that are important and things that are not important. When we are in pain, we begin to ask ourselves, what is really important to us? And I think when we are in pain, we are called to focus our eyes on God in our pain like never before. Does God deliver us from pain? The answer is absolutely yes. He is a good, merciful God. He delivers us from pain. But not always. Because sometimes God wants to deliver us through pain, not from pain. Sometimes God wants us to walk through that path of pain and to come out different on the other side. Sometimes a person who is in a bad relationship may need to put up with that bad relationship so that they get purified out differently from the other end. Sometimes it may be a physical ailment and yet God wants us to, to say, now I want you to really focus on the things that count. You know, it is quite interesting. When we are healthy, we are distracted by so many things. We want to do this stuff. We want to do that stuff. We want to do so many other things. Our lives are filled with so many busy things, you know, uh, <clears throat> including things like computer games, you know, very important for some people. And, and then when we are down, we begin to understand what is really important. We begin to trash a lot of things that we have wasted time on. And sometimes in our pain, we can accomplish more than in our health. And so 
Pain is a necessary part of holiness. Pain is a necessary part of God cultivating our holiness because it is through pain that we begin to focus and we begin to understand exactly where it is that God wants us to be. I lived in the suburbs in America and it's supposed to be the ideal place in between um, the country and uh, the urban areas, right? You can drive to the city for all your shopping and you can uh, go to the country if you choose to do so. The house has a nice yard. It says that, you know, the typical American household, you have, uh, you know, two or three kids with a dog and a minivan. I've got almost all that except a minivan. <clears throat> got three kids and a dog, you know, and a house with a yard. Um, no picket fence. No need for picket fence because... Um, well, it's kind of too expensive to put up a picket fence. But, but still, it was a nice life. And yet, I can tell you something. I can tell you that there is a lot of pain even in this so-called nice life. One day, I was taking a flight from Singapore back to the States and I was sitting beside this um, guy uh, of somewhat African origin and learned later that he was from Haiti. So I said, where are you from? He said, he's from Haiti. And he asked me, where are you from? I said, I'm from Singapore. He said, oh, we are from Singapore. I was there for two days in your country. Oh, it's a beautiful place. I if I have the money, I would love to settle in Singapore. And a lot of Singaporeans would say, huh? <laughs> Why in the world do you want to live in Singapore? We are all looking to immigrate. <laughs> he cannot see the pain because he's not here. But from outside, it looks wonderful. And indeed, Singapore is a great place, a very efficiently run city and, and a lot of good things in Singapore. Uh, but there's also a lot of pain. And if we think that we can immigrate somewhere else and lose that pain, we are sorely mistaken. Pain will follow us wherever we go. It doesn't matter where we are. We will experience pain. It is our response to pain that is going to be different. And I therefore like to, maybe at this point, put a quick word of caution. That there are some people who give false promises. That your, it is um, your best life now, for example. The Bible tells us our best life is never now. Our best life is in the resurrection. To say that your best life is now in this life cannot be anything but a lie because it contradicts everything that the Bible tells us. It is not going to be your best life now. You can keep hoping and hoping and hoping and then at the end of it, nothing happens. Or you can learn to be delivered through pain. See, what happens is this. <clears throat> the dynamics that happens to the individual. If I'm suffering and in pain, and I believe that God will heal me, must heal me, and somehow deliver me, and I'm encouraged and I'm hopeful and I hear all these assurances and that I must be delivered, then at the end of it, I'm not delivered. Well, they say, well, anyway, it's all right, I die happy <laughs> because I've been hoping all along. So even if it doesn't happen, you know, when I die, I had hoped and then I've died. It's okay, you know. And, and that's one way of looking at it certainly. Another way of looking at it is to recognize certain realities, that sometimes certain pains are not meant to be healed, and that we need to learn to grow in the maturation process. We need to learn, learn holiness through this pain. And so when we come out at the other end in eternity, we become holier. We become what God has intended us for, uh, for us to be. There are two types of temptations. And I've said it before, I, I bear repeating because this is actually not commonly taught. One set of temptations are pain-related temptations and the other set are pleasure-related temptations. So we must not forget that there is one temptation and that is the pain avoidance temptation. We want to avoid pain. And so we do things to avoid pain. There's pain avoidance. And then there is the, the indulgence of sinful pleasure. So um, like when Jesus Christ was going to the cross in the Garden of Gethsemane, the last temptation of Christ, there was no pleasure involved. There was only pain. There was only the temptation of not picking up the cross, to accept the pain or not to accept the pain. 
and Jesus Christ embraced the pain. And the same thing he told his disciples, pray that you do not fall into temptations, that you do not yield to temptation. There was no pleasure there, there was only pain. There was denial of Christ and escape the pain or admitting Christ and perhaps facing the, uh, the consequences. So there are pain temptations that Christians hardly ever talk about today. And because we do not talk about it, we cannot understand what First Peter is saying. First Peter is saying that we must learn to say, on the one hand, no to sinful indulgence, but on the other hand, to say yes to certain pain in life. Because that is what God has given us as our lot. And until we do so, we do not understand holiness. So now we begin to understand why in the midst of pain, Peter tells them, be holy. Because accepting that pain is that path to holiness. They were being persecuted. And Peter is saying, accept that pain. That is the path to holiness. And in your holiness, in accepting that pain, you are going to find inexpressible joy. Some of you, I think most of you, have seen testimonies of people who have been persecuted, who are in prison. And you see the joy in their lives, and you see the beaming faces, and you see how exuberantly they talk about Christ, and, and how they, they embrace their suffering. And you say, I wish I got joy like that. And why do they have joy like that? Because they are willing to be delivered through pain rather than delivered from pain. And so Peter tells them that they are to accept holiness in order to be uh, delivered. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Be alert and, sober, uh, and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Again, as a quick note, this verse again tells us that they were all going through suffering at that point in time. Okay? Uh, there is no deliverance. They are going to have to hang in there through the suffering. Okay? So any preacher that tells you that in Christ there is always deliverance is telling you a lie, is giving you a false hope. It is, is keeping you from developing holiness. That is God's character. Here we are told that the devil is a lion. He prowls around. He's going to devour you if you get a chance. Now, I don't know whether it has already happened or Peter was seeing it or it was all coincidental, but eventually Christians were thrown to the lions. You know, literally, a lion prowling around, seeking whom he may devour. And eventually they did devour Christians. But he's saying that's what the devil is like. The fear of pain, the fear of death is going to make you deny Christ. So be alert, accept it, and that is your path to salvation. Do not be afraid to embrace pain when that pain is to be justly embraced. And so Peter calls them, uh, tells them that the devil uh, is like a roaring lion. This is very different from the message that you hear in some quarters today. You know, God wants you to be happy, to be healthy, to be delivered from everything. So just deny Christ, it doesn't matter, you can confess Him again later. You know, um, or, or something of that nature. Okay. But Peter says, no, there is a particular purpose for our suffering. And that is to make us holy. It is a scary prospect. But what pain does for us is that it purifies us by creating focus. It redefines our motive. You see, when, when we are in pain, as, especially say we are, um, let, let's say we are in a situation where we are deathly sick. You know, we are come down with a terminal disease. And, and, and the Lord heals us. And we thank the Lord and we praise God and we are very happy. Five years later, we catch the same disease. <laughs> and it has come back. And, um, and this time it is terminal. And we are going. Okay? It purifies our motive. It causes us to ask, why did I follow Christ? Will I follow Christ even if He doesn't heal me? Will I follow Christ if this illness should lead me to the grave? It causes us to examine our hearts. Pain causes us to look at things in a way that the lack of pain never can. We cannot project ourselves into that situation and say, well, if I'm in this situation, what will I do? You will never know until you are there. 
Okay. And so pain purifies our motives. And pain purifies us by demanding choice from us. It demands, it calls us to choose. For example, if a person is terminally ill, he has to decide how he's going to spend the rest of his time. If I've got three months left to live, how am I going to spend my time? Some people say, well, create a bucket list, you know, all the things that I want to do before I die. Is that what you want to do? Well, what happens on that bucket list? What do you have on your bucket list? Is it the things of God or the things of self? The prosperity gospel is a dangerous gospel because it gives false promises of deliverance from all pain. In pain, uh, we need to strengthen ourselves. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, it says, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. Holiness involves doing. It is true that holiness involves abstaining from sin. That's true. But abstaining from sin requires you to do something. Remember earlier on, we are, I used the image of a military. While well, you now know that the devil attacks on two fronts, on the front of pain and on the front of pleasure, but what are we doing about it? Even if you know that he's attacking, you can be hit in such a way that you don't have the strength to say no. So how can you build out yourself up? And that is, this is why Peter tells us that holiness is about doing. Be holy in all you do. Holiness is not about legalism and self-righteousness. You know, some people who are so-called holy are the most obnoxious people in the world. And, and we don't want to have that kind of holiness. Uh, a story I once heard which really impressed me was, was this seminarian. He was... <clears throat> going to entertain this big wig preacher who was going to come to his church to preach in the evening service. And so he went to pick him up in the airport and he was apologizing, saying, you know, I live in the trailer home. It's kind of small. I've got three kids and they are young and my place is a real mess and all that kind of thing. And, and the, the, the preacher, the big wig preacher, uh, you know, assured him, no, it's all right. Don't worry about it, you know. And when he got into the trailer, true enough, um, the three kids were there, kids... Uh, Toys were you know, thrown all over the floor and all that. And so this preacher is still in his coat and tie, went down on all fours, played with the kids, joked with them, laughed with them. They even rode horsey on him. And, and, and you know, they were, their faces were beaming. And then when they sat down for a very simple supper, you know, he, he made the hostess felt like a million bucks. That night, as husband and wife laid in bed, you know, the husband turned to the wife and said, you know, I, I feel almost as if Jesus had just visited us. And the wife says, you know, the funny thing is this, I was exactly thinking the exact same thing. Okay. Holiness is not about poise. It's not about carrying yourself in a certain way. It's about a certain attractiveness and winsomeness, the ability to, to draw people into your own life and the ability to project the love of God into the lives of people. That is the true meaning of a holiness that is so desirable, so winsome, that we must certainly look uh, seek after it. You know, sometimes we hear bad things about the Puritans in, in New England, you know, that they are this and they are that. They are, uh, you know, basically very nasty people and don't trust anybody who wears a hat that has a buckle on it. And Well, we, you hear all kinds of funny things about Puritans. Well, don't believe them. Because the world is determined to make fun of Christians. And they are just mockers. Because uh, the Puritans did make some mistakes for sure. They, 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 there are certain mistakes in their lives as there are in our lives, in our day. But do not join in the mockers and reaffirm and say that the Puritans are legalists and the Puritans are nasty people and the Puritans are not good. Because if you really know about the Puritans, they are people who sincerely sought to live after God's word in every way. They might not understand all of scripture correctly, but what they understood, they tried to live it out. For example, and this may shock some of you, for example, a wife once complained to the elders of the church that the husband was not paying him enough attention at home, in bed. Um, and, and, um, and the elders hauled up the husband and basically had a good talk with him as to why he was ignoring his wife. Okay. And, um, and, and 
because the Bible tells us that they, they are, they are, as far as possible, they should live as husband and wife, and he should not neglect her. So, so they are not those um, nasty people that um, believe, uh, say, use the word no for everything in life. Okay? Um, it's not true at all. Now, uh, in some churches, perhaps, in the background that I come from, um, there are some people very concerned with the King James Version. In fact, there was an, an elder who says that we must use only the King James Version. Now, it didn't matter that Sunday school teacher after Sunday school teacher came up and said, my kids don't understand. How do I teach them using this version? It doesn't matter. It's in the Constitution. It's in the Constitution and therefore you do it. This is the nasty kind of legalism that you see in the Pharisees. This has absolutely nothing to do with the holiness of God. The holiness of God is the, is the love that reaches out. It's the love that reaches out to those who do not understand and make the gospel simple so that they can understand. Many times we think that, oh, if they make more demands, more requirements, they are more holy. No, if you make more demands and more requirements that are outside of Scripture, it's just legalism. It's not holiness. The King James Version is good. It is a good version, and I don't knock it. Uh, but, um, but if the, an office bearer's concern is just to keep the Constitution, whether it is the, the King James Version or something else, then it tells us something about the office bearer that this person has no spiritual quality. If you have to weigh between certain words of a constitution versus lives in need, well, at the very least, change the constitution. You know? but, but how can you say, go by the letter of the law and ignore the spirit of the law and allow people to, to hurt, to perish, and not to be fed? So holiness is what God expects of us. True holy people are so desirable. So I plead with you, never to be like the Pharisees. They lay stumbling blocks to people who want to come into the kingdom of God by imposing their own rules. That is not holiness. That is legalism. What holiness is not is living a life that is physically removed from temptation, the temptation of pain or pleasure. Going to a monastery is not holiness because we need to walk through temptations, the temptations of pleasure and the temptations of pain in order to come out holy the other side. Holiness is not the use of Christian lingo. Some people think that if you say praise the Lord, praise the Lord all the time, that makes you holy. You know, it doesn't. Christian lingo doesn't make you holy. It's very easy to learn it. In fact, Christian lingo has probably less than five phrases. You know, hallelujah, praise the Lord, amen, and stuff like that. And so if you say often enough, people think you're very spiritual. Uh, that doesn't make you holy, okay? Uh, what is holiness? Well, <clears throat> holiness is the abolition of all known sin from your life. That's holiness. First Peter chapter 2, verse 1 says, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. So Peter is listing out possible sins. He's saying, get rid of all this stuff that is in your life. <clears throat> Well, the grace of God is the grace to overcome sin. It is not the grace that ignores sin. And again, there are preachers today that tell you the grace of God is to ignore sin. If you have sin, don't need to confess your sin. Just confess the goodness of God. It's amazing. It's amazing that people can say things like that and get away with it. The Bible tells us to confess our sins. And until we confess our sins, we cannot confess the grace of God. The grace of God includes the grace to overcome sin. The grace of God put Jesus Christ on the cross to die for our sins, but there is also a continuing grace of God that empowers our lives through the Holy Spirit so that we can overcome sin. So grace is not just a one-time event that makes us positionally right with God, but a transforming daily event that continually makes us holy before God. Perhaps some of us are still in the bondage of sin. 
I do not know what your poison is. You know, for some, it is a sin that is rather um, socially unacceptable and apparent. You know, any sin in the sexual category becomes rather prominent and becomes kind of um, elevated. But some sins are very acceptable, but you know that you have them. For example, the sin of laziness, sloth, you know, just wanting to sit back, wanting to, you know, uh, take time off when you're supposed to be working, skiving, uh, that is a sin too, right? And, and, and it's almost like a acceptable sin, you know, it's quite all right. But if that is the sin that you have in your life, that is a sin habit or addiction, then perhaps that's one that you need to address. Or perhaps it's an idolatry of work. That work becomes so important to you that everything else has to be put aside just because of your work. And perhaps that is your, your sin addiction that you need to address. Perhaps it's a sin addiction of studying, of getting good grades you know, for students. Perhaps that is your idol and the sin that you need to address. Or perhaps it's a person. I love this person so much, I don't care if this person is good or bad or whatever it is, I want that person. Perhaps that is the sin addiction that you need to repent of. Or perhaps some people have a problem with pornography. And perhaps that is something that they need to address and to get rid of. Perhaps it's hatred for some people or bitterness towards others. And they just cannot get rid of this anger, hatred or bitterness towards certain people. And perhaps that is your sin addiction, that is your poison that you are hanging on to your life. Perhaps it's envy when other people are doing well and you are not doing as well and you say, why is that blank, 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 doing so much better than I am, you know? <clears throat> Oh, he doesn't deserve it. You know, I, I, I work harder, I work better, I'm more honest, but he seems to get all the promotion and we become envious. Perhaps that's something that we need to lose. Or the greed for money. Or even gluttony, etc. We need to be liberated from the bondage of sin. I think we need to look at all these and say that. We hang on to our sin because it gives us a certain pleasure. Because it gives us a certain delight. It is almost like an old friend, you know, like bitterness. I've harbored this bitterness in my heart for so long. I don't know what it means to live without this bitterness. So I'm going to just hold on to it. You know, I'm just going to hold on to it. But we want holiness and holiness is a liberation from the bondage of sin. How is that done? Well, first of all, we do it in prayer, in deep confession. Not just to confess your sin, but in deep confession. Now, what, what do I mean by deep confession? We really need to take time out to pray. <clears throat> I know, well, I've done it. Maybe you have done it too, I don't know. I'm doing something and, and then suddenly a thought comes to my mind. and say, oh yeah, this is something I need to pray about. And so I pray about it. And it's not wrong. It's good to do that, you know, to be in, in constant communion with God. But certain things in our lives, especially the confession of sin, needs special time. We need to take time out, go on our knees and pray. It is not good to say, Oh yeah, God, I, yeah, thanks for reminding me that this thing that I've been doing is not so good. Sorry about it. You know, and then we go on. And no, that's not deep confession. Because if we take the time to go on our knees before God in repentance, God will open up our hearts and our minds and will not only show us this problem, but there's also the other problem. And He begins to expose a certain depth in our hearts that we have not seen before. He begins to peel out all these layers like the layers of an onion to get to the core within us. Then there's fasting. <clears throat> you know, we need to fast in order to focus our attention on God. We need to pray without ceasing. When we pray without ceasing, we are basically conditioning ourselves so that we purge our, our hearts and our minds of all evil thoughts. But we cannot go into to all that all at once. <clears throat> we need the Word. Uh, first uh, Peter chapter 2, verse 2 says that newborn babies crave pure, pure spiritual milk so that uh, by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted, the Lord is good. So we are to crave spiritual milk like newborn babies. We are to be disciplined in developing a love for the Word of God. We are to purify our passions and desires. First Peter chapter 1, verse 17 says, Since you are called since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here with reverent fear. Sorry, um, I missed out the first uh, text. <clears throat> 
as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. We are to transform our desires. Many times we stop ourselves at the action point. But God wants us to stop ourselves at the desire point. Meaning that when we say no to a temptation, this is good. We are saying, yes, I'm not going to indulge in a sinful pleasure. Uh, uh, yes, I'm going to uh, accept this uh, 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 justified pain that's going to come into my life. But it is very hard to do that unless our hearts are first tuned right. And so we are to first cultivate the right desire. So do not conform to the evil desires. You see, sometimes Christians harbor a lot of desires within our hearts. We, we harbor envy, we harbor lust and all that. And when the opportunity to sin really comes our way, we find it impossible to say no because we've already been harboring it. You know? and, and so the, the point of address within our lives is the desire level, not when we're actually given that opportunity. And then we are told to live as a foreigner mentally, um, that we are foreigners here and we are to live in reverence fear. Now, many of you have traveled, I have traveled, and some of you continue to travel. And I do not know what you do with your currency after you are leaving the country. I know I've got um, a, a travel wallet with all kinds of strange currencies around the world. And I've always thought that wouldn't it be nice if they have a charity box just outside at the airport, right? And then when you're a traveler, you're leaving the country, you're not going back anymore, you've got all this stuff that's of no use to you anyway. When you go back to your home country, you cannot use it. Give it away, right? And that is what a foreigner is. A foreigner is a person who has no stake. A foreigner is in the country is the one that says, when I go back to my home country, all this money that I carry with me now becomes nothing. It has absolutely no value. So live as foreigners on this earth. Look at the things that you're holding on to now as a person who is visiting a country and before too long you're going to leave this country and you are going to have to exit everything and put everything down. If you can bring it with you, it does you no good anyway. <laughs> like all the currency in my wallet. <clears throat> In fact, I had some British currency that was so old and I didn't know that they had changed the, the coinage and all that. Then when I went back to the UK and I used it and they looked at me and looked at the coin and said, you know, what is this stuff? So, um, I mean, what, what good does it do? What good does it do me it's for, for, for me to hang on to it? And, um, and in fact, I've been thinking of writing to the charities to say that, you know, you put a box over there at the exit, right? At the, at the uh, uh, checkout so that tourists can uh, dump their money there, you know, and, and give some donation. <clears throat> okay. We do. There is now? Okay, great. Yeah. And, um, well, what is your kingdom? I think the conclusion of the matter is this. Have you made a commitment to holiness in your life? I think a commitment to study God's word is good. That's knowledge. A commitment to giving is good. And we are told, we are taught that we need to be committed uh, to giving in a tithe. Um, is commit uh, uh, to be committed to serving is wonderful. But what about ourselves personally? Are we committed to holiness? Because holiness is really that core. It is that liberation from the bondage of sin. We do it by deep confession, by intentional discipleship, one that is life on life. You know, if somebody, um, uh, if, you, if you want to be um, helped along by a mentor, you know, don't be afraid to go to the person and say, can, can you give me some time uh, uh, once a week, once every two weeks that we connect so I, there's a certain accountability to you. Can you guide me along in my spiritual walk? We need to change our value system that we seek after holiness and not happiness. We need to change our worldview. We need to understand that we are really foreigners. Our citizenship is in the kingdom of God. And I must confess that I am not all I should be in holiness. And tonight I'm going to close with a prayer. A prayer essentially for myself. Okay? But I'll invite you to pray this prayer with me. A prayer for holiness. And if you think that this is also something, a goal that you want to have in your life, a prayer for holiness, then I request that you pray with me and pray aloud. We really need to verbalize our prayers more. Okay, so um, let's close with this prayer. <clears throat> holy, 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 
my Lord God Almighty. I bow before you because you are the one and only holy God. I draw near to you in your beauty of holiness, but I also draw away in fear because I am not holy. Lord, I come before you confessing my sinful habits. I ask you for a fresh visitation of your Holy Spirit that I might become more eager for holiness. Purge me from all sin that I might live a holy life before you all the days of my life. Lord, you know my obedience to you is so fragile and my love for you so inadequate. Change it, Lord. Lead me to love you more. Lead me to the holiness you want of me. Come now and take control of my life for the sake of your Son who died for me. Amen.